Who was that? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we may have uh, a few stragglers coming in once they get their coffee, but let's get on. I'd love to introduce you to Andrew Cooks, who's going to tell us about all the hopefully wonderful things that happen after you quit your job to work on FOSS. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for coming to my talk. I'm going to tell you about what happened to me after I started a business to work on free open source software. My goal is to plant the idea in your mind that you perhaps could also start a business and work on open source software. First I'll tell you about what happened before I quit my job and what motivated me to do this. And then I'll describe the opportunity that I saw uh, and most of the, the, the bootstrapping of the startup. And I'll conclude with how the startup came to an end and how I ba went back to employment as a software engineer. In 2014, I was working as a software engineer developing audio over IP codec devices for public broadcast radio. Think of conference phones but higher audio quality and more audio channels. Now, if you've spent much time on conference calls, you'll probably be familiar with uh, audio dropouts and stuttering. Will you believe me if I tell you that many of those, uh, much of that stuttering is, is entirely preventable? Let me explain what I mean with some diagrams. This is a very simple generic audio over IP transmission path. There's an audio input, an encoder, some networking gear, a decoder, and a speaker, or an output. Now this basic transmission path is essentially the same for hardware appliances like conference phones, uh, as well as software like Jitsi or WhatsApp. In this transmission path, there are two kinds of unavoidable delays. First, there's the fixed and bounded delays, which are part of the system design, and then there are the variable and usually unbounded, uh, but totally expected, network delays. And there's a third type of delay. This is the preventable delay, also known as bugs. This is, these delays are unexpected and completely unbounded. Now, a variable network delay usually gets the blame for this, but it's not always the problem. In fact, the system design usually compensates for variable network delay by adding a jitter buffer and various other features that add additional playout delay. But these features may also contain bugs. In summary, the problem is that the audio buffering breaks due to unpredictable delay variation. So the solution in my mind is simple. To avoid stuttering, we need to fix the bugs and test the features. And we do that by measuring the delay variation in the transmitter and by doing repeatable tests of the receiver under controlled but non-ideal network conditions. Here's the diagram again. Instead of a typical near-perfect LAN connection, we add a bridge. And on the bridge, we run an application to detect and quantify the delay variation in the stream coming from the transmitter. The bridge can then also emulate WAN conditions with configurable impairments like packet loss and jitter to test the receiver. So this problem and solution came to me while I was working on the decode buffer of the radio streaming codecs. Despite having known bugs in the product, uh, the tools we had were insufficient to allow me to improve this jitter buffer um, without introducing regressions. And as this problem and solution became clear in my mind, so did my desire to claim back my most productive time and spend it on something that really mattered to me. I wanted to help fix the stuttering problem everywhere. This was also the year after I first attended LinuxConf in Perth. And after years of using Linux and open source software for commercial projects, I desperately wanted to change my work environment so that I could be more involved in the open source community and contribute something back. So in December 2014, I left my job to work on this solution. 
I called the solution Jittertrap. I waited for my employment to come to an end before committing code to the Jittertrap repository because I wanted to be sure that there wouldn't be any intellectual property problems later on. This is a screenshot of a live instance of uh, Jittertrap, a demo instance. You can find it on the net if you look around, uh, but please keep your bug reports until after the talk. Um, as you can see, there's a step change in the chart, which in this case uh, corresponds to a Wi-Fi hiccup. So how did this business expect to earn an income? Well, the plan was very simple. Uh, the software would be free, but I would be selling a hardware appliance and perhaps some uh, consulting and custom solutions. The hardware appliance would enable more specialized use cases because every company has got different problems to solve. Hardware sales is a known business model and has worked for numerous other companies, like, for example, Riverbed Technology, uh, the sponsors of Wireshark, and just about any uh, Android phone maker as well. So this is the proof of concept uh, jitter trap hardware or buffer upper minimum viable product. Some of you may recognize this as a PC Engine's APU created by Pascal Dornier in Switzerland. It is supplied with open firmware and open schematics. It meets the requirements of buffer upper at a very reasonable cost. So how much did I expect to earn or what, how big did I think this opportunity was? So this spreadsheet uh, is called a market size estimate. And the big attention grabbing numbers at the top are published figures from market analysts um, and apply to a whole market sector. For example, the Ethernet test and measurement market is worth more than a billion dollars, US dollars. So these analyst figures, how they relate to a new venture is mostly guesswork. And these guesses are biased, and they're not very scientific. But nevertheless, we have to make a guess in order to determine whether the opportunity is worth pursuing. So I tried to be conservative in my estimates and came up with a number of 2,500 units uh, for about $2.5 million dollars of profit. And that's after paying myself for research and development. So that number suggests that there's enough of a, an opportunity for a small lifestyle business. It's not enough to attract venture capital or create a massive empire, but just a small lifestyle business. Of course, that would be higher risk, but much greater potential reward than just being an employee. So now you might recognize my business plan. Step one, build stuff. Step two, don't know. Step three, profit. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what happens at step two. But before that, there's a step zero. Before we can get started, we have to think about the risk and rewards of doing this. So before I quit my job, I thought long and hard about the level of risk that I'd be willing to take. And that's when I decided to back myself to figure out step two of that three-point business plan as I go along. I was fortunate to have support of my partner who covered our basic living expenses from a salary. However, it meant an unpleasant number of meals consisted of Vegemite on toast. Uh, and I also had some savings set aside for the business, which I kept separate from our personal finances so that a crisis on one side of the firewall would not harm the other side. I certainly did not want to spread the risk to my friends or family. So containing the risk is one part, but quantifying that risk is equally important. I had to ask myself uh, what the opportunity cost would be. How much sac salary uh, could I afford to sacrifice or forego? And in my case, my financial sponsor and I came to an agreement of one year. So take the one year and add to that the $10,000 that I had put aside in savings. That's not very much. It's uh, basically enough to buy some product stock 
uh, and it's not really enough to pay anyone to solve problems for me uh, or to do development work. But that was the appropriate amount for me. It was an amount that I could willingly risk. And in hindsight, hindsight I think it was totally appropriate for the early stage of business development that I reached. Another thing I learned that you absolutely can and probably should do before quitting your job is to do some basic uh, market research. Who else competes in this market space? Uh, who are the customers? How much are the customers willing to spend? And where do the customers shop? Where do they buy the stuff? So here's what I did. This is a table of competitors uh, selling products relating to network emulation, network performance management, network application performance management. As you can see, there are plenty of smaller players. Uh, we can compete against smaller players. And there are some larger players, too, to give us a si uh, an idea of the size and, and, uh, of the market and growth opportunities. Uh, I mentioned riverbed technology earlier. Well, they are the billion dollar gorilla there at the bottom of the table. So two observations from this table. Clearly, giving Wireshark away has not harmed their business in any way. And secondly, uh, given the number and size of related competitors, there must be a market for these sorts of products out there. So having identified the kind of product and, the, and who makes them, I went and found prices for the product. Uh, and again, here's a list of companies and the, and the sales prices or retail prices for some of these products. So these are related products, not products that solve exactly the same problem. Uh, in this case, I looked at network emulators and expanded my search from there. So first we find the related products, then we find the distributors of those products. Uh, then we go on these distributors' websites and look at what other related products and distributors exist, and we find the prices. So this exercise is about discovering what sales channels exist and also where the customers are shopping and how much they're willing to spend. So here's a map um, categorizing the customer types for the kind of products that I was interested in. On the left, we have product design and developer roles in mustard yellow. Uh, on the right, we have uh, operations, support, and infrastructure roles in green. And then top and bottom are slightly different. Telecoms engineers at the top, their equipment uh, is kind of advanced and sophisticated and really expensive. And it's not really a market that's um, open for startups to compete in. And at the bottom, uh, uh, web developers don't typically spend a lot of money on physical products to get their job done. So the operations and infrastructure people are well served by the existing tools. It's really the, the product development people on the left in mustard yellow uh, that lack new tools. So from this, we can learn the type of market. The green boxes are an existing market. The customers know where to shop and they know what products exist. The yellow boxes are a new market which means that the customers don't necessarily know where to get this kind of product or that this kind of product exists. So it's more difficult to reach those paying customers in a new market, but that's where the growth opportunities are. So my plan was to use free open source software to help develop this new market of applications, performance, test and measurement tools for developers to use. See, I believe that the stuttering problem is a problem for developers and not just for network operations people because I'm a developer and I had this problem. So software developers, once they've identified a problem, often want to build a solution just like I did. In fact, I discovered several homegrown systems on my journey of uh, customer discovery and I considered this to be a good thing because it's a sign that there's a need for my solution. 
I thought that maybe those developers who uh, would adopt and use and perhaps even contribute to my solution if it was open source software. And I thought that for each of these developers who had the motivation and the time and the know-how uh, to come up with their own system, there would be many more who do not have the time and who would be eager to buy my product. So these people who have the budgets uh, and who would be willing to pay money for a conveniently packaged solution, they would be my customers. Hence the distinction between users and customers. See, because I believe the users and customers to be mostly different kinds of people, I didn't see a problem giving away the software to users who wouldn't be paying customers anyway. The thinking was that open sourcing the solution would improve the product and boost the product reputation, and that the users talking about Jittertrap and sharing it with each other excuse me, would somehow save me from having to actively market the product to prospective customers. At least one of those beliefs is wrong. So by now we have developed a number of uh, implicit hypotheses. We believe that the customers, that the users are developers. We believe that the customers are uh, developers with budgets or development managers or team leaders under time pressure. We believe we know how much they're willing to spend, up to $2,000. And so we know where the existing types of customers buy the existing types of products, but we don't yet have a clear sense of where the new types of customers would buy the new types of products. Instead, our hypothesis is that this is a new market and therefore there are no existing sales channels. So first, we'll try to get users, and then we'll worry about getting customers. And of course, because we love open source software and know other people who love open source software, we believe that a community will magically rise up and write code and that it would spread to more users. So some of you are probably thinking that these hypotheses are ridiculous, and you'd be right. Some of them are. Of course, you already know the outcome of the business. But the point is it takes time to develop a new business model. And having explicitly stated hypotheses gives you a better chance to pinpoint the problems and correct the mistakes. It enables a better understanding of how and why the business works or doesn't work. So hopefully you'll agree with me that it helps to explain the business to other people. Startup founders have many different kinds of things to do in a day and problems to solve. As a founder, you will never get bored because you'll always know exactly what you need to do and why that thing is very important. I found that for me, working more than 40 hours of, in a week on doing just focused development time was not really sustainable and was a really bad sign that I was neglecting the business development. I also found that I had to time box the development tasks to improve the overall throughput of tasks and prevent burnout. And I learned that my most productive time for solving technical problems was to do them first thing in the day. This was a marathon and not a sprint. And I, so I kept a regular routine to make life feel just a little bit more normal. Of course, having so many varied things to do can be very daunting at times. Uh, it requires a multitude of different skills, and the context switches can be very hard. It's not just switching from, say, C to JavaScript. It's switching from multi-threaded real-time code to designing business cards, or from debugging garbage collection pauses in the browser to writing marketing material for the website. But the biggest challenge I had was really talking to prospective customers because I really don't like being judged and evaluated. 
See, I felt that everything from my code to my language skills to my fashion sense to the colors and fonts on the website was being examined all the time. And it turns out that this is also a barrier to building community around the project. But let's look at two more general challenges to be aware of. I want to point out that there's a clash of cultures between open source communities and startups. See, open source projects emphasize uh, technical merit to build dependable software, as well as reputations. We spend time to get the technical details just so. But lean startups function completely different. Lean startups aim to build the minimum viable product. They do that to learn what's important to customers, what the customers are willing to pay for, to eliminate waste. And I find it really tough to strike a balance between this strive for perfection in open source software and finding the thing, that the bare minimum that we can get out the door to the customer. So in hindsight, my choices often favored writing better code rather than getting to the market faster. And I don't regret it, but it probably contributed to startup failure. Initially, I used the Jittertrap name for both the software and the hardware. The idea was that one brand would be stronger than two and provide free marketing. But actually, that turned out to be really confusing for everyone. See, the business people got distracted by this idea of giving away the precious intellectual property. And the free software people got suspicious that I was trying to exploit people for my own personal gain. So I really struggled to get a simple, coherent message across. And therefore, I decided to split the business into a new brand called Buffer Upper so that I could have simpler conversations with customers and keep people's attention. So clearly, as you can tell, I was in way over my head. Uh, and I want to talk about where you can find help. See, friends and family are the obvious people we would go to, but a word of caution, don't wear them out. See, your stress would spill over to them, and they can't really fix your business, regardless of how much they love you. I also didn't get much value from attending startup networking sessions at startup incubators. See, Engaging with people in that way helps build confidence and practice your elevator pitch. Uh, but I had nothing in common with the people who attended. And it was really full of posturing and posing. What I did find very helpful, though, uh, was to attend a small, less than 10 people, a startup workshop group. These people were not cagey about their great ideas or their trying to protect their secret recipes. Um, it was really great for open and honest discussion. And the kind of understanding and questions and analysis really helped me to stay out of the rut. We worked through a book called The Startup Owner's Manual by uh, Steve Blank and Bob Dorf. And that book provides practical step-by-step -step guidance from the very first steps, the very beginning of your startup. I highly recommend it. So what really went wrong with Buffer Upper? The honest answer is, I don't really know. I don't have the facts. It seems like I wasted time on a problem that wasn't sufficiently important, or maybe the solution doesn't sufficiently solve the problem, or maybe I just couldn't connect with the people. But what I can tell you is I know what the scale of the problem is. For comparison, this is a, a GitHub uh, traffic view of a, a different hobby project uh, that I'm working on. It's a fork of an out-of-tree uh, network driver, that, and the project's only been around for about four months. As you'll see, uh, so it's, it's neither uh, original or unique, but it, in this two-week period, it had uh, 
13 clones and 124 views. That's without me speaking to anyone about this. And here's Jittertrap for the same two week period. Three clones and 24 views. So clearly, there's not really enough interest for anything more than a hobby project here. So I learned that it doesn't really matter whether you, you think you're building for the open source community or for customers. As long as you're building stuff in isolation, you'll never have either of those things. Don't throw your code over the wall because it doesn't work. So I learned that I really need help with the people side of things. Because I'm clearly not going to turn into someone charismatic and extroverted by reading a book. <laughs> but I also learned that the question is wrong. That question. It implies that the engineers have the solutions and we just need to find the customers. This is what I call the solution trap. We need to turn this around. You can say that the sales and marketing people have existing customer relationships and sales channels. And those customers have problems to solve and budgets to spend. All that's missing is the right widget to sell them. So this is why accountants never consider sales and marketing uh, to be cost centers. But research and development and engineering departments are always cost centers. So since I care more about solving the technical problems and don't have existing customer relationships, it's easy for me to fall into the solution trap, and that's what I did. So changing the mindset and getting out of the solution trap is essential for the survival of your startup. It doesn't really matter what the people should want. All that matters is what they do want, or that you can learn and adapt to what they actually want very quickly. Unfortunately, I couldn't pivot to an existing and related market and find something that customers already want because I was too emotionally attached to the code. I couldn't learn what I needed to learn for the business to progress. And I just couldn't force myself to go out there and hustle up some interest in customers. So financially, uh, the savings that I had set aside uh, were insufficient to make any of these problems go away. And at the time, our single household income was at risk due to circumstances beyond our control. So after the year uh, that we agreed upon and a couple of months of grace, it was time to cut my losses, recharge my savings, and fix my mental health. Fortunately, I landed on my feet. Things worked out pretty well for me. My work environment and my salary both improved. Today I'm working uh, on core boot and kernel drivers, which is exactly what I want to do. And my employer allows me time to send patches upstream. But I still get really anxious about posting patches to a public mailing list or standing in front of you. Luckily, it doesn't seem to matter that I built the wrong thing, just that I built something that can be evaluated to determine a level of technical competence. And excluding this talk, there's been very little interest in my startup founder experience. So in conclusion, it takes a lot of determination and hard work, but it's not crazy. Uh, success is all around us. And if you learn from my mistakes, maybe you can also be successful. So have a go. Thank you for attending my talk. Am I not on? Oh, now I am. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Andrew?
get a mic. Um, hi, Andrew. You, you mentioned towards the end that your mental health suffered. Um, do you have any tips on uh, dealing with the mental side of things, mental health, motivation, that kind of thing? I don't have any silver bullet advice. Um, I can tell you it took me about a year to get back into work life after this. Um, yeah, I'm not really qualified to, to give that kind of advice. But um, there, there are some support groups that I'm aware of. Uh, Blue Hackers is a contact point that you can look at. Um, and if, uh, by all means, if you're going through something similar, send me an email. Um, it helps to talk to people who understand. That's a very good point. Anybody else? No? I'm sure if you see Andrew around and have any questions for him, he'd be happy to talk to you. But in the meantime, from the very lovely people from this conference, I have a small token of appreciation for you for all of your work and for coming along today. Thank you very much. Thank you.